Uh, hi, everybody. This is the hydrography community communications call. Um, just in case you're confused by the name, we used to call this the advisory call, um, but um, there are some special rules about advisory committees in the federal government. So uh, we changed the name just to make it clear that's not what this is. Um, I'm Al Ray. I'm the co-lead uh, for the hydrography program at USGS. Um, and um, want to introduce uh, Conrad Hafen, who is um, he's he's been uh, with USGS for a long three, three or four years now. Conrad, I can't remember. Yeah, about uh, four years, I think. Yeah, and he was um, working on his PhD. He just recently finished. Congratulations, Conrad. Thank you. Um, he got his PhD at the University of Idaho. Um, and he's going to be presenting about a, lo a lot of the research that he did as part of his dissertation. Um, and uh, he's now with the Idaho Water Science Center um, as a hydrologist. And um, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and let you take it away, Conrad. All right, thanks, Al. Um, so I worked on stream permanence and stream permanence modeling for my dissertation work, and I'm going to present on that today, like Al said. And so I'm considering stream permanence and dynamic stream permanence estimates at both regional and local extents. And I'll give you a, just a kind of quick overview of where this presentation is going to go. I'm going to talk about kind of the importance of stream permanence uh, and why, why we're focusing on that. And then I'm going to go into kind of three case studies or three different scientific studies. One is the accuracy of existing stream permanence classifications within the National Hydrography data set. The second is modeling stream permanence on the on headwater streams in the Pacific Northwest that are associated with the NHD network. And the third is implementing a physically based model at a more local scale to simulate stream permanence. And I'll kind of pull in the broader context of these contributions and what we can do and expect as we move forward with stream permanence modeling. Uh, to start off, I want to give you an example from my hometown in Santa Clara, Utah, down in the southwest corner of Utah. And this is the Santa Clara River you're seeing a photo of. And this is around the time of peak flow and about the magnitude of peak flow in a normal year. Uh, the Santa Clara River goes dry uh, at some point almost every year, uh, but it's also a desert river and can, can have some flashiness to it. So you can see the peak flow here. Uh, in late 2004, there was a flood event on the Santa Clara River. You can see here December 24th. This is a pretty substantial flood for the river. And by about two weeks later, that flood had uh, continued to grow to a very dangerous stage. And in fact, many uh, there was much property damage and many homes were lost throughout the region uh, in, in, in early 2005. And so this just illustrates kind of our complex relationship with water, how we need enough, but not too much. And we want to know when we're approaching either end of that, where we have low flows, where we have high flows. And the USGS gauge network uh, was developed largely for those purposes. And this just shows a snapshot um, of, of water conditions throughout the nation that was taken this March. And the purposes of this gauge network, there are three primary purposes that they mentioned in their report. Water management, uh, so making sure we have enough water and know how much water we are is, is going to be available. Uh, design flood flow so we can plan for floods and plan for safety. And then to assess climate related trends that may affect future water availability and future floods. The things, um, if, if, then if we go to to more of the policy side and, and determining how water bodies are regulated, they're regulated under kind of a, a different set of rules. And so if we look at the Clean Water Act jurisdiction um, and where the Clean Water Act applies, we're going to kind of focus on two categories here. And the the the, the uh, regulatory determinations themselves are much more nuanced. This I'm just kind of breaking these down into these two simple categories. The first is traditional navigable waters, which include large rivers and lakes. And the second includes perennial and intermittent rivers and streams that contribute surface flow to navigable waters. 
So if we look at this, the regulatory status depends on the duration of surface water presence as defined by intermittent and perennial rather or perennial intermittent, yeah, perennial intermittent rather than um, the magnitude of flow that we see happening in those rivers and streams. So when we talk about stream permanence, that's what I'm talking about, is how often is surface water present in a stream channel? Now, I'm sure you've heard the definitions of perennial, intermittent, and ephemeral, and depending on, on where you look at those definitions, there could be a little bit of variation. Um, I'm gonna focus on two other definitions, permanent and non-permanent. And permanent encompasses streams that have continuous surface water present throughout a year, and non-permanent are any stream channels that experience a dry condition any time during the year. And so you can group perennial into the permanent category and intermittent and ephemeral into the non-permanent category. And I'm sure I'll probably slip up and use intermittent and ephemeral or perennial at some point. So just know that I'm referring to the permanent, non-permanent categories as we go on here. And so, when we're talking about this, we kind of have these two competing measurements. We have the magnitude or how much flow there is, and then we have a flow state, whether flow is is present or absent. And we could we could you know pose the redundant question: which of these is more important? Is it more important to know the difference in the magnitude of flow or to know if there is flow or there isn't flow? And for different applications, uh, there's going to be, I guess either one of these measurements could be better than another. If we're talking about water availability or flood analysis, it's more important, obviously, to know the magnitude of flow. When looking at ecology and water quality, the magnitude of flow can be important, but also the presence of flow is important. And then for regulatory regulatory determinations and habitat identification, we might be more interested in the presence versus absence of flow. And our USGS gauges can kind of get us to those top two breakoffs, but they don't get us as well, um, at least spatially continuous data down in that lower presence of water classification. Part of the reason for this is that stream gauge coverage is limited. So this figure here is showing stream gauges uh, in the Pacific Northwest region. And the colors uh, represent stream gauges on different stream orders. So the light blue uh, is first order streams and up to the red, which is on ninth order streams. Now the red, uh, outlines here on this graph show the proportion of the stream network according to the medium resolution and HD that occur in each of those stream orders. And so the main takeaway here is that if we look at first and second order streams, a much larger portion, oh, excuse me, we just, looks like we've got our slideshow exit out there. Um, but a much larger portion of the stream flow or a much larger portion of the stream segments occur on these first and second order streams than we have stream gauges. And so they're underrepresented in the gauge network, which is simply an artifact of the priorities of that gauge network, which is not to monitor uh, for those ecological purposes. And so the National Hydrography Data Set, NHD as we all know it, is the best source of data for a lot of these headwater streams. And the hydrography or the hydrology there is described by these um, perennial or non-perennial intermittent ephemeral stream classifications that we have from the NHD. The one challenge we run into here is that the NHD presents these single static classifications of perennial, uh, intermittent, or ephemeral, but stream networks are dynamic and discontinuous. And this is some work from Godsey and Kirshner in 2014, and they surveyed streams in multiple basins. And this is a snapshot from one of those basins. And you can just see that depending on the time of year and the year, the flowing extent of the stream network changed. And so that's not completely captured through those static NHD classifications. Um, this presents some potential problems for regulatory mapping because, as we know from the USGS, the NHD is the most up-to-date and comprehensive hydrography data set for the nation, but from the EPA, the existing tools cannot accurately map the scope of clean water act jurisdiction. Um, and so in order to, if we want to map clean water act jurisdiction, we need to find some new tools that can account for some of that uh, discontinuity and dynamism in stream networks. So that brings us to, well, what next? How can we get there? Um, and I wanna focus on, on two things that can maybe help us improve our stream permanence modeling. 
So the first is, um, since NHD is not adequate for mapping Clean Water Act jurisdiction, can we find where and when NHD disagreements occur and find out what might be causing those and use that to springboard forward to some modeling? And then can we use process-based hydrological models to effectively simulate stream permanence? Um, so I'm first going to talk about some of the NHD agreement and disagreement I mentioned a minute ago, um, and then move on to two different modeling applications. One, um, modeling in the headwater streams of the Pacific Northwest, and one at a, at a more local extent. So first let's talk about um, some factors that can influence NHD agreement and disagreement with other observations. And I'll just note there's a, a citation here. We published this work uh, about a year ago. Uh, so you can you can see that publication if you're interested in some of the more deep and some more uh, details there. So the National Hydro Hydrography data set, both the medium resolution and the high resolution hydrography derived from USGS topographic maps. And you can see an example of Wolf one here showing part of the University of Idaho experimental forest uh, up in northern Idaho. And you can see there are perennial streams and non-perennial streams marked. Um, those non-perennial streams encompass both intermittent and ephemeral streams. And those were digitized or processed via various means into the network we see today, which has, uh, which is a digital representation of those maps. And we can see perennial, non-perennial streams here for a different portion of, of that forest. So the question we have is, well, how accurate are these classifications? They were made by survey crews who actually observed conditions on the ground, but often during only a single visit. Um, and other field studies have observed a 50% disagreement with NHD classifications, and those and those disagreement rates have been shown to vary between different climate regions. Uh, these studies often focused on smaller study areas um, over larger extents, um, and so it's a little uncertain exactly what's causing some of those variations. So our objectives here were to quantify agreement between the NHD stream permanence classifications and other observations using a large regional data set, and then determine the effect of climate differences between when the NHD classifications were determined and when other observations were made, um, and how that affects the probability of those two data sets disagreeing with each other. So the general approach was to compare these other observations, other stream permanence observations, to the NHD stream permanence classifications, and link those to the Palmer Drought Severity Index to describe the climate at the time the NHD was the NHD classifications were made and the other observations were made, and then determine how that difference affects the probability of, of the observations of disagreeing with each other. Um, the first step we took here was to just create a map to visualize the years that these topographic map surveys were conducted. Um, and a couple of takeaways here, this shows uh, basically a, a one decade period for each of these, these symbol classes. And a couple of takeaways here is you'll notice there are some regions, like we can see some over here uh, in Idaho, where we have topographic map surveys being conducted multiple decades apart for adjacent maps. Um, and so that just indicates that first the climate the climate conditions during those surveys for adjacent maps could be quite different because they were conducted uh, decades apart. We can further take a look at this uh, when we take a look at the PDSI, the Palmer Drought Severity Index, during the survey year. Um, and if you take a look at some of these, um, and just to explain the scale a little bit, a value of negative two uh, indicates a period of drought of negative two or less, and a value of, ne of negative four or less indicates a period of extreme drought, and you can think the opposite for those positive values where it's a wetter than normal year or an extremely wetter than normal year. And so we map this out, you can just see that adjacent maps were collected. Um, some of these, like there's a couple in Idaho here, you can see some over in Kentucky here um, and throughout throughout the United States where, peer, where quad maps that were surveyed in a very wet year are adjacent to quad maps that were surveyed in a very dry year. And as the NHD classifications derive from those, we could expect just some variation based on the climate trends to come from that. 
Um, I want to give a shout out to the people who provided data for this study. So here I'm showing a map that, it, that includes about 10,500 observations of surface water presence in streams. A lot of these came from the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality. Um, some came from state agencies in Oregon, Washington, uh, tribal nations, and some other federal agencies, including the EPA. So each of these observations just uh, marks a location and classifies that location to either have surface water present in a channel or absent in the channel. And these were the observations we compared to the NHD stream permanence classifications. Uh, and this data set is published uh, as a USGS data release that's linked below if you're interested to, to see those data or use them for your own studies. So we then took the NHD stream permanence classifications linked them to the nearest points, did some quality control, and were able to find out where disagreements occurred. And so here I'm showing you overall disagreement between both versions, the NHD medium resolution and the NHD high resolution. And so the takeaway here is that we saw about 80% agreement between these in situ observations made throughout the Pacific Northwest and the NHD stream permanence classifications. Um, but we did also see um, some disagreements, and so we want to focus on where those disagreements occur and why they might be occurring. Now, when we break this up by stream order, we start to see, get an idea of where these disagreements occur. Um, so here we have the number of, of observations, the ones that agree and disagree on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, I've broken this out by stream order. So you can see that the highest disagreement rate, which is about 45%, occurs on first order streams, followed by second order streams. And after we get out of those, those lower stream orders, um, those disagreement, the disagreement rate decreases. And this is only for the high resolution NHD. I didn't do this for the medium resolution NHD. And so that breaks out kind of the where part. The next question we have is how climate is affecting these disagreements. So if my observation, if I go to a stream during a wet year, but the NHD classification was made during a very dry year, what is the probability that those are going to disagree and is climate playing playing an effect in these disagreements? And that's where we pulled in the PDSI and calculated the difference in PDSI between those two observation dates. And I'm going to walk through uh, this chart here with you and then I'll show you this for multiple stream orders. And so here we're looking at this for first order streams. And these are the results of a logistic regression model. Um, and so let's start on the x-axis here. So on the x-axis, we have the PDSI difference. And this just indicates whether a field observation, a non-NHD observation, was made in a wetter or drier year than the NHD classification by the, the field survey crew was made. So on the right side of this axis, we see that the NHD was determined in a wetter year than the field observation, or in other words, the field observation was collected in a drier year than the NHD. Uh, so if we're looking at the far right side of this axis, this indicates um, where the difference was very great and the, the field observations were much drier. And if we look on the left side of this axis, it indicates a very great difference between the climate periods and the uh, field observations were much wetter or the NHD was collected in a much drier year. And now you'll notice that as we look at this graph, uh, that we have two lines. We have a blue line and a dry and a, and a uh, red line. The red line indicates the probability of a dry observation disagreeing with an NHD classification. The blue line indicates the probability of a wet observation disagreeing with the NHD classification. And so you can see that as those wet observations were collected in very wet NHD years, the probability of disagreement decreased. And when those dry observations um, were were collected or were, were matched up with an NHD that was collected in a very wet year, there's a higher probability uh, of disagreement. And I'm going to move on here. We can take a look at this for all stream orders. And we see these same these same trends for all stream orders, just with different magnitudes for wet and dry observations and obviously different different levels of confidence based on the number of observations we have. And so this indicates that disagreement is affected by the climate conditions that are being experienced when the NHD surveys were made and when subsequent field observations were made. And so a couple takeaways from this. First, we see greater disagreement on low order streams. Um, 
and that climate is playing an effect on when these disagreements occur. And so this just gives the indication that if we add climactic variables to our stream permanence modeling, or gives an indication that we need to add climactic variables to improve our stream permanence modeling. And that's kind of what these next two studies will focus on is, is a couple different ways to, to include those variables. So this study is gonna focus on modeling uh, stream permanence and headwater streams with the water balance model in the Pacific Northwest. And I talked about how stream networks are dynamic and discontinuous. And the point of this study is to try on a monthly basis to capture some of that dynamism and discontinuity. And I'm showing here an example of a statistical model that does this called the probability of stream permanence model or PROSPER. And I'm showing these the PROSPER outputs for the same area where the NHD is shown. And right now on this slide, those estimates are shown for 2004, which was a dry year. I'm going to move on to 2011, a wet year, and 2015, a dry year. And this just shows how a model can capture differences um, as we flip through those between years, which the NHD stream permanence classifications do not capture. Now, this is a, st a statistical model. Um, we're looking to do this more with a, a process-based model, which gives some more flexibility in terms of predicting these things out into the future and not being limited um, by, by parameter estimates for some, some covariates. Now, NHD Plus already has, I guess you'd call it a quasi-dynamic component. If you're familiar with the, the EROM values, the enhanced runoff method, those flow values. And so to get those, the NHD Plus implements the USGS Thornthwaite Monthly Water Balance Model. I'm going to call that the Monthly Water Balance Model, or MWBM. And it's averaged um, for monthly and annual flow across a 30-year period. And so if you've ever seen maps like this, and I'm not saying these were made with those EROM values, but the EROM values provide data that can that can help you make maps like this and show these things somewhat dynamically with, with monthly averages of flow. And so our idea was to use the same model and the similar approach to do this uh, not averaged over a 30-year period, but on a monthly time step uh, uh, that are for a discrete time, for a discrete year. Uh, I'm limiting the modeling only to headwater streams for a few reasons. Uh, first, that's where we saw the greatest disagreement with the NHD classifications. It's where the fewest USGS gauges exist, and so we have the, we don't know what's going on in those headwater systems as well, and so if we can get those to be to be correct, then we have a better chance, I think, of moving, applying that model downstream. Um, to other areas, and it also simplifies the modeling because we don't have to route water down through the stream network. So the objectives here to determine if the MWBM can generate dynamic stream permanence estimates on the NHD network with better or similar accuracy to the existing NHD classifications, and then assess the precision of those estimates from the model on headwater streams in the Pacific Northwest. So this is a quick diagram of the monthly water balance model. The inputs here are temperature and precipitation. These bold abbreviations indicate model parameters that adjust processes uh, or values. And I've simply added on uh, a flow threshold parameter that uses the mean monthly uh, runoff or mean monthly, you can think of as mean monthly discharge to break out streams into non-permanent and permanent classifications. And so the general approach to this study was to identify regions that responded similarly to, model, to changes in model parameters and model those regions with different parameter sets and assess the accuracy of those parameter sets to observe data. And I used the same data set from the, from the first study, um, but limited to headwater streams, and then identify the suitable parameter sets and assess model precision in each of those calibration groups. And this should make a little more sense as I go through um, some of the results here. So first, this shows parameter sensitivity. And so basically what I'm showing here is the effect, the relative effect that changes in each model parameter have on stream permanence classifications for each headwater stream segment in the Pacific Northwest. And just the important takeaway here is to notice that these relative sensitivities vary based on parameter and that different parameters have different sensitivities in different regions. Um, the point of this was to get these sensitivities and use, then I used an unsupervised classification to group 
stream segments, these headwater stream segments together based on how similar the sensitivities were for a given stream reach. And when I do that, I come up with these eight calibration groups, I call them. And you can see that there is some spatial correlation between these, but there's they also, some of them span the entire Pacific Northwest region. A couple things to note, you can see how this group eight, kind of this pink air, this pink color um, represents a lot of mountainous regions. Um, this group five green represents a lot of these wetter uh, forests that aren't high alpine areas. Um, and then we get some of the, the pink that represents some of these drier areas that come throughout Idaho on the Snake River Plain and on the, the Columbia Plateau. But this was done completely numerically using a k-means unsupervised algorithm. And this breaks, this just shows you kind of the distribution of those um, calibration groups throughout the study area and the number of uh, field observations we had to associate with each one of those. I then performed a calibration of the monthly water balance model for each of those eight calibration groups. And I tested one million parameter combinations for each of them and then recorded the overall accuracy, the accuracy of wet observations, and the accuracy of dry observations um, against each parameter set. These, uh, or each parameter set was evaluated uh, against the NHD, against the accuracies from our previous study to identify which parameter sets gave good results. And so for a parameter set to be deemed suitable, it needed to produce at least 65% overall accuracy and be at least 60% accurate with both wet and dry observations. Over here in this table, um, the ID shows the ID of the calibration group and shows the number of suitable parameter sets identified for each calibration group. And these other columns show the range of accuracies um, represented by those calibrate or represented by those parameter sets. You'll notice that three of these calibration groups, one, seven, and eight, did not have any suitable parameter sets. So we take those when we take those parameter sets and apply them all to the model, or apply them all with the model to the streams, we can get an idea of how precise the estimates are. So this is showing the average model precision over the study period, which is 1977 to 2019. And when I say model precision, the way this was calculated is I ran this, I ran the model for each suitable um, parameter set. So if I go back here, for example, you'll see that the group two had 32 suitable parameter sets. So I ran the model at each stream reach 32 times with each of those parameter sets, and then took the proportion of those that predicted the same classification. So we come back over here, um, uh, a blue color or a high precision value indicates that all or nearly all of the parameter sets predicted the stream to be permanent for a given month or for a given year. And as we average those, we get this value. If we see a low or a red value, that indicates high precision for a non-permanent classification, which means that all or nearly all of those pseudo parameter sets predicted the stream reach to be non-permanent for a given time period or group of time periods. And then a low precision indicates that about half um, of, of the parameter sets predicted one classification, the other half, the other. And so I'm gonna show you how this can, can show some dynamism as I go through and show this for individual years. Um, so this is the average across the whole study period. If we look at a dry year, 1987, you can see we have much higher precision um, for non-permanent streams and not many streams exhibit high precision for a permanent classification. If we go to a more normal year, we see some more precision for those permanent classifications. As we move into a um, wet year, we see where we get high precision for those permanent classifications and how we have some decreased precision in the non-permanent category. 
I'm going to pull this back and we'll look at this kind of a summary for the whole Pacific Northwest. Um, and so this is showing the percentage of headwater streams that had a high precision value from these classifications. Um, and so if you take a look at the black line, this is basically the sum of the dark blue and the dark red and indicates the percentage of headwater streams that we could say had a, a um, precise estimate for each of these years. And you can see that varies between about 28% and about 45%. And so on these headwater streams, this model is producing precise results for up to 45% of stream segments. Now, I didn't do a formal accuracy analysis here because I only had about 2,000 headwater observations to work with, and I'm using those observations to model 1.3 million stream reaches. And so if I pull any of those out for an independent accuracy assessment, it really limits the, the calibration step of the model. Um, and so I'm going to get into this here in just a sec with with these, but we really need more data to appropriately estimate the accuracy of some of these models uh, for stream permanence classifications. Another thing to note with the uh, the monthly water balance model, you'll notice that three of those groups didn't have uh, good accuracies, and that could be that the the model doesn't represent some processes that are important to hydrology in those headwater areas. And also the model doesn't include any kind of topography, which can be a very important influencer of stream permanence. So this indicates we might need to use a more detailed model or make some adjustments to the monthly water balance model in order to, to have more confidence in the stream permanence estimates it produces. So that's gonna bring us to um, this, final, this final section where I used a kind of full-fledged process-based hydro hydrologic model to estimate stream permanence in some smaller areas where we had a little more data. And so for this, I'm using the Watershed Erosion Prediction Project model, which is called WEP as an abbreviation. Um, it accounts for topography, land cover, soils, and climate at the hill slope scale. Um, and it's designed for to be used in small watersheds, and it's been implemented for both erosion and stream flow studies uh, across a variety of environments. Another reason I chose this, it's really easy to implement using uh, a cloud platform developed by the University of Idaho called Web Cloud. So anyone can go on and for any area in the United States, produce a web simulation. Now the objectives here are to evaluate WEP and WEP's performance for estimating stream permanence in both gauged and ungaged watersheds. Uh, and then a secondary objective here is to calibrate WEP in an ungaged watershed using stream permanence observations instead of stream flow observations. And so the general approach for this was to set up uh, initial WEP models online with WEP Cloud for our study areas, then calibrate WEP to observe stream flow observations observations or stream permanence data, depending on the study area, which we'll get into here in just a sec. Um, and then to calibrate or to evaluate the accuracy of daily and annual web stream permanence estimates from stream permanence data. So I used two study areas here. The first was the H.G. Andrews Experimental Forest, which is in Western Oregon. Um, in this water, I used eight gauged watersheds from the H.G. Andrews Forest. Uh, these all have a gauge record from at least 1993, and many of them go back even into the 1950s. These are small watersheds. Uh, they range from 10 hectares to 100 hectares. And in addition to the gauge data, we collected stream permanence observations through human observation, which these, those are shown here with these uh, blue, yellow, and red triangles to indicate where uh, surface water was or was not observed in the summer of 2020. And then we deployed thermistors um, where when we put a temperature sensor in the stream and an adjacent one on the bank, we can get an idea of when the stream goes dry by comparing the two temperature time series. So those were deployed in addition to the, the existing gauges in this area. Second is the Willow, White, Willow and Whitehorse watersheds, which are over in Eastern Oregon. And where the H. Andrews receives over 2,000 millimeters of precipitation a year, the Willow and Whitehorse watersheds receive about 300 millimeters a year. So we have a very humid and then a very arid environment to compare. 
In these areas, uh, thermistors have been deployed from 2011 to 2017 as part of a bull trout habitat study. And so we used only thermistor data that's shown at these locations in these watersheds here. I'm going to walk through the H.G. Andrews simulations first um, and go through the results there, and then I'll walk through the Willow Whitehorse methodology and results from there. Um, so I calibrated WEP uh, to observe stream flow in the H.G. Andrews watershed and adjusted four parameters that affected the shape of the hydrograph and the uh, water balance uh, for, for the model. And then I evaluated those simulations to find the best simulation based on three goodness of fit metrics, which include percent bias, the Nash Sutcliffe efficiency, and the Nash Sutcliffe efficiency performed on the log of discharge. And the reason I used the NSC, the log NSC, was because that gives a better indication of how well the model discharge fits observed discharge for low flow periods. And those low flow periods are going to be the periods that determine stream permanence when the stream goes dry. Um, I selected parameter sets based on those goodness of fit metrics where the percent bias needed to be less than 25%, the Nash Stuck Cliff efficiency greater than 0.3. And when those two conditions were met, I maximized, um, I chose the parameter set to maximize the log NSC. Um, a stream reach was classified as permanent for a year when the simulated stream flow was greater than zero for all days from April 1st to October 31st. I only considered annual stream permanence in the HG Andrews because all those thermistor observations, which gave daily data, they all came back as wet, and so they didn't give us enough data to actually evaluate um, how well the model did on a daily time step there. So when we model this with WEP, um, you can see here the results we get. And I'll walk through the legend real quick because I'll use the same legend throughout the rest of the talk. Um, the the kind of lighter blue and red colors indicate where the model correctly classified a per or a permanent stream as permanent and a non-permanent stream as non-permanent. The dark blue indicates where a non-permanent stream was modeled as permanent, and the dark red indicates where a permanent stream was modeled as non-permanent. So with the model initially, we had 61% accuracy for these eight watersheds in the H.G. Andrews. But what we found is we looked at this a little more. We found that four stream reaches in these watersheds one and two were misclassified by our data collection. Um, so our data collection, um, when we observed, made human observations at points, they went to a point and just observed if they could see continuous surface water along the channel. And there were points on each of these that observed continuous surface water and no points that observed discontinuous surface water. However, that was an artifact of our random sampling design. As we talked to the H.J. Andrews staff, we found out that these stream segments, these four stream segments actually go dry every year. And so the model did a better job of representing it than our field observations did, and that resulted in an accuracy of 83% in the H.J. Andrews. We're going to move on to the Willow Whitehorse simulations here. I mean, the Willow Whitehorse, there were no stream flow gauges to calibrate the model to. So instead, I calibrated the model to uh, based on agreement with wet and dry observations from those thermistors that were made daily in the Willow and Whitehorse watersheds. Because there were fewer data to calibrate on, I only altered parameters that affected the shape of the hydrograph and then the evapotranspiration. And I calibrated this based on daily and annual accuracy to stream presence observations. And then I included a dry day threshold in the calibration as well, which basically sets the maximum number of dry days that can be allowed for a, for a permanent classification. And so if you have a dry day threshold of one, that means a stream can have one dry day, but still be classified as permanent for the year. And then I evaluated those parameter sets um, and I'll present kind of the findings from that here. Um, just as I go into these next slides, I'm going to just inform you of this adjusted accuracy I met, a metric I used. And it's basically penalizing the overall accuracy, which is the percentage of correct classifications and adjusting that by the, the accuracy with wet observations and the accuracy with dry observations. <coughs> 
And the reason for that is if we take a, take a look at some of these streams, some of these streams might go dry for 20 days a year. But if we're looking at a 200 day period of record, we can still have 90% accuracy just by classifying every day as wet. And so 90% is a high accuracy value, but it did not capture at all that dry period. And so using this adjusted accuracy penalizes the model results if we don't get both wet and dry observations correct. Okay, so I'm gonna walk through these graphs first and then I'll come back over to the table. So on the y-axis here, I'm showing an accuracy value, and those accuracy values are for dry accuracy, wet accuracy, and the adjusted accuracy I just described. On the x-axis is the overall accuracy, and so this is going to show a couple things. One, it's going to show how wet and dry accuracy differ as the overall accuracy increases and how adjusted accuracy kind of mirrors that overall accuracy. Um, and it's also going to show you kind of what the maximum accuracy for each of these uh, basins is. And so we can see if we just take a look kind of the Willow Whitehorse watershed number one up here at the top, that as um, the overall accuracy increases, it's driven by an increase in the accuracy with wet observations, even though we see a very high decrease or a very extreme decrease in the accuracy of dry observations. And the adjusted accuracy kind of mirrors that. So the adjusted accuracy peaks um, right in here, you know, around 0.65 or around 65%. And we see that kind of same pattern um, with a different peak for all four of those watersheds. And this is for, for daily accuracy. So this is using daily observations as the accuracy metric. If we come over here and look at um, this table, we can see for each watershed, the accuracy um, of those daily observations. And so for watershed one, 63% accurate, watershed two, 66, watershed four, 64, and water, watershed three, 64, and watershed four, 82%. Now, a main takeaway here is that even though we had relatively high daily accuracies, if we look at the annual accuracy, and if we predicted that stream to have water all year or not, we see those annual accuracies um, generally are much lower than the daily accuracies. So that indicates these daily accuracies aren't capturing when a stream goes dry or when it stays wet very well. Now we can take a look at kind of these same graphs, but doing this for annual accuracy. And you'll notice the accuracy values are a little better for, well, quite a bit better for watershed one and about the same for watershed four and slightly lower for watersheds two and three. I'm going to move on here and go into this this by adding the dry day threshold, which adjusts for that a little bit. So when we add a dry day threshold, we can see a little bit of increase in those accuracies, getting up to 60, getting up by about 2% for two and three, and then by 10% for watershed four. Um, and so adding that dry day threshold or allowing a certain number of dry days for the stream to still be permanent um, makes some sense for some of these watersheds. Okay, now I'm going to summarize these results for two, for a couple of watersheds um, across the entire period of record. This kind of I've kind of given you just an overall idea of how these accuracies look, and we can kind of break this out um, a little more. And so this shows the accuracies, um, annual and daily accuracies, for each of the stream reaches or each of the the sample locations in watershed one. And so the daily accuracies or the annual, sorry, the annual accuracies are represented by the colors in the grid. So once again, the lighter colors of blue and red indicate a correct classification of a permanent stream and a correct classification of a non-permanent stream. Um, the dark red indicates a permanent stream that was modeled as non-permanent, and the dark blue indicates a non-permanent stream that was modeled as permanent. Then the numbers inside each of those squares indicate the daily accuracies for that year. And I want to draw your attention to a couple of these disagreements here. So first in the stark red, we see that even though we had high daily accuracies for these two stream reaches, they, the model produced incorrect classifications annually. And so these were streams which were permanent but were modeled as non-permanent. And we see the same thing 
down on this one for a non-permanent stream that was modeled as permanent, even though 83% of the days in that year, or 95% in this case, were classified correctly. I'm going to move on to Watershed 2 and show the opposite thing happening, where on these two stream reaches, even though only, you know, 15 or 16 or 21 percent of those days were classified correctly, we still got the overall annual classification correct. Um, this brings up some, I think, some important considerations as we consider models and evaluating stream permanence models. Um, the, there's a couple of takeaways from the HD answer we learned that our current data collection methods and current data may not actually describe reach scale stream permanence well. Um, from Willow Whitehorse, we learned that it's important to assess stream permanence models on both daily and annual metrics, so we're getting the full picture of what's happening with that model at those stream reaches. Um, and there, are, it raises a lot more questions about how well do stream permanence calibration simulate stream flow with the variation we're seeing, and it would be interesting to do this in a basin where there, where we have some gauges and some more stream permanence data to identify if we can actually use stream permanence classifications to calibrate to stream flow where those data aren't available. Um, I want to wrap this up with just a few a few thoughts, maybe pulling in some other other ideas for context. Um, but stream permanence is easy to observe, but it can be difficult to simulate. It's really easy to see if there's water in a stream or not. Um, and we have the capability to model that stream permanence, but we're somewhat limited by the data we have to evaluate those models. We can evaluate them in specific locations, but evaluating these at regional um, or sometimes even local extents, there just aren't enough spatially and temporally dense data to get a good picture of how to calibrate those models. Part of that can be due to how difficult it is to characterize subsurface and channel characteristics. Um, for these applications, we're talking about flow disappearing, right? We can have a very, very small amount of flow, and what causes that flow to disappear? Um, and that can be those can be very, very small things that are hard to capture in these models. And as I mentioned before, both the temporal and spatial variability are important as we consider these models, which makes um, a much greater burden of data to to calculate those things. Um, second. We're limited by data, as I mentioned before, but if we just take a look at the data used for these modeling applications, um, we can get an idea of the spatial and temporal differences with stream gauges. And so on the left, I'm showing the data set used to evaluate the NHD, and we have 10,500 discrete observation locations, which is five times more than we have for USGS gauges, really 2,100 USGS gauges in the same area. However, those USGS gauges collect three quarters of a million observations per year if we're just collecting daily data, um, but we only have 10,500 total observations with those stream permanence observations. So we need to increase the spatial and temporal density of these observations to get better data to inform models. And part of this is going to involve deliberately collecting data at the reach scale. I just want to use this as an example for how data collection schemes can affect um, how we evaluate models. And so if we randomly select data, data sampling locations, we could say that all these streams in this basin are permanent. If we always collect data at these locations, just by the look of the draw, we can always find a, a wet location. Or we could select dry locations. I think these were all dry except for maybe the main stem. When in reality, we need to be focusing maybe on reaches and not just points so we can get an overall picture of what's happening uh, with these reaches. And the one way to do this might be to focus monitoring where stream reaches are most likely to go dry, but identifying those locations uh, could involve some more work. But so moving forward, I think there's a lot to be excited about. As we know, the USGS is working on collecting LIDAR for the entire nation, which hopefully will result to updates for the NHD. Um, data collection apps are being developed, which is pulling in citizens for citizen science and collecting more data. And recently I've been uh, seeing more focus on data collection headwater streams, uh, which will give us those data once again to, to help calibrate and validate these models. Um, so thank you for listening today. Um, and I just want to make sure that all these folks here get acknowledged who've helped out with this project in, in various ways. 
And uh, if there are any questions, I am happy to take those. Great, uh, Conrad. Thanks a lot. This is really, really informative. Um, we have some questions in the chat that basically are kind of getting at the question of, are um, you know, what do you consider permanent versus non-permanent in terms of like, um, you know, is it like you can have pools of water in a channel that, that may be not may may not be flowing is that considered permanent is it not and the other idea that was expressed was kind of about um water that's maybe flowing underground uh either in a like sandy channel or in a like in the mountains where the you may have like a, in a say a glacial moraine where uh the water's flowing down under a boulder field and you can actually hear it but uh, can't actually see it on the surface. So kind of uh, as far as like the work that you've done, what, what would you be considering permanent versus non-permanent in, in those different scenarios? That's a good question. And it highlights some of the complexities of collecting stream permanence data. For this application, and because of those considerations you just mentioned, we we focus simply on surface water. And so if there was water visible above the surface, um, that stream reach would be, we, we use, we, I, and I, I guess when you get to permanent, permanent implies also a, a time scale, right? And so these observations are, are, are based on surface water presence at one point in time. And so, so for us, a permanent stream, at least at the point in time, would be a stream that had surface water continuously throughout the channel. Any stream where there were dry portions of the channel visible would have been a non-permanent classification. Um, and I, I didn't do a good job of explaining this, but the way we determined that, I guess, determined the annual stream permanence was any any dry observation on any stream reach indicated that stream was not permanent that year. And then we we determined permanence by limiting that to any observations that said the stream had surface water um, in August or September. We used that as an indicator the stream was permanent throughout the year, which um, the stream could have potentially been dry the day before, the day after, a month after, a month before those observations were made. But based on the data we had, that was the best way we could could break those up to describe the annual condition. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Conrad? We presented a whole lot of whole lot of information. Hello, Al. Yeah. This is Jim Mitchell. Hi, Jim. Uh, in uh, 93 or 94, when I was at the Kansas Geological Survey, I saw a presentation uh, by the Kansas water quality folks where they went and they took all of the stream gauges in Kansas and uh, eventually, uh, essentially blinked out the rest of the net upstream network from all the gauges that went to zero at some point during the year back in the early 90s. And about the western two thirds of the state just disappeared. Now, most of that isn't, you know, like headwater. These are like, you know, lower uh, or higher order reaches, if you will. Our explanation at the time was, you know, the groundwater dropping out of the bottom and no more base flow. And I just wonder if the mechanisms for these permanents or not permanents uh, you know, really are different kinds of things depending on where you are, high in the watershed or low. Yeah, I'm I'm sure they are. Um, and that's kind of why we're starting to explore some of these process-based models. We can represent those things in those models. Um, but I also don't think, as I kind of showed here, we haven't got to the point where we can model this consistently enough to identify how much of an impact those processes may be having. Um, and so I think that's kind of the goal is if we can get these models developed and have the data to develop these models, we can hopefully represent these processes and find out 
why these streams might be going dry or the thresholds that the might affect that. Another observation that was made was that in the in the uh, spring, after things thawed out and we started getting uh, growth and crops and things in uh, you know in the plains, that uh, the uh, wintertime flow, if you will, that happened in you know ditches and uh, uh, low order streams, uh, uh, you know, started to disappear again. Evapotranspiration in that case right, pulling water out of the soil and not contributing to any flow. I think there's a lot of things going on here. I think slope aspect and a lot of other stuff could affect this. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <clears throat> right, Conrad, you know, another th thing that, um, you know, I've thought about with this is any of the models that you've been working with, they really can't take into a into account uh, some very localized geologic factors like you know you have a fault or something that's just um, you know essentially snatching the water right out of the channel or by conversely you know may have a, a, a perennial stream a uh, spring on a channel that wouldn't normally have flow but then you've got this perennial stream spring that's contributing flow to that channel. So it's it's like none of the models that I heard you talk about could get into that sort of specificity specificity <laughs> uh, on sort of local on a local scale. Right, yeah, and and you're exactly right. And I and and that's why I think like we use these models for stream flow, right? Um, and these models perform really well for stream flow in a lot of instances, but I think taking that step to stream permanence, I think we're starting to learn a lot about those things that are influencing stream permanence by seeing where these models are wrong um, and how wrong they are. And then also being able to kind of say, okay, well, we figured out some of the reasons that this might be the case. And can we, can, you know, can we go back and, and adjust these models or develop some new models that are going to account for these things that, that we find to be important for stream permanence. And then I think also going back to, to looking at data collection, we've used, you know, we've used stream flow data for, for developing these hydrological models for so long that we're modeling something new that has different characteristics and we need different data to evaluate our models on. And so going back and saying, okay, well, how do we collect data to inform these models as, as we move forward? Um, so I think there are still things we can learn from these models, even though right now I don't think these process process based models are producing, you know, necessarily results that can be used as far as mapping stream permanence. I think we can use them to um, further understanding and further our methodologies for for finding stream permanence models. Yeah, great. Uh, <clears throat> so thanks. Thanks again, Conrad, for your presentation has been really interesting. Um, with that, I think we're right out of time here and um, we'll call it a day for today. Thanks again to Conrad. Uh, we'll see you next month. Bye-bye.